Hello. Uh, so I'm Ramek. I'm a PhD student in computer science at Georgia Tech. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that I've done in the past few years, uh, which is basically tying information visualization and touch-based interfaces. So right off the bat, there's actually three different scales we can consider or, or look at uh, when we're considering this space. Uh, the first is uh, mobile, uh, second is tablets, and the third is large touch screens. Uh, to be more specific, uh, mobile is something we say it's less than seven inches screen size. Tablets are between seven and 10. Uh, and anything greater than 10, we, uh, we're calling it like large screen sizes. Uh, all of them follow very different design paradigms, uh, not just because of the difference in size, but because of, also because of the way they're used in different contexts. Uh, but InfoVis fits in some or the other way uh, in each of these. So this, for instance, uh, was one of our explorations uh, for bringing interactive. Oh, wait. So okay, I can't see it moving here. All right. So this is one of the explorations for bringing interactive bar charts to mobile devices. Uh, the interaction here supports things like realigning the stacked bar chart, uh, and also things like zooming into the view and panning the bars. On the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, a standard InfoVis technique of dust magnet uh, here working on a large touch screen, on a large touch uh, display. System supports collaboration where multiple people can be on the same view together and be interacting with the system. We're not the first people to have done information visualization on large touch tables. Uh, this is a tool called Cambiera, uh, which does document visualization, also focusing on collaborative aspects, and the author of the tool is actually sitting right here, Danielle. Uh, he's going to be talking to you guys tomorrow. Hopefully not about this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so having built on all of these different platforms and understood the constraints and challenges, uh, we expectedly found them to be very different. Uh, but the focus of this talk is specifically on the challenges uh, that we had on the, on the tablets. So tablets have come a long way in the past couple of years. Uh, even two years ago, you could say the resolution and the processing power could not match those of PCs, but that's not really the case today. Uh, they've progressed tremendously. Uh, and that was one of the reasons we started exploring this space of bringing visualization to tablets. Uh, I work with my advisor, John Stasco, and a few of our other uh, collaborators uh, in doing so. Uh, and this is one of the first explorations we did. So this is a scatter plot visualization technique running on an iPad. The video is going to demonstrate to you the different techniques uh, we adopted. Uh, it'll run about two minutes, so it'll, but it'll give you the context of all the different features so that we can talk about them uh, subsequently. Can we have the volume on the? Yeah.
So a lot's going on in there. Uh, and before I delve deeper into the design guidelines, design considerations, or the decisions that went into it, uh, I would just want to take a, I'm just going to take a quick detour. Uh, so Richard Buchanan, who started the CMU School of Design, uh, wrote an essay on the design uh, in the digital age, and he basically articulated three properties of good design, usefulness, usability, and desirability. And I've often used these principles in my own work, uh, and I'd like to use these to contextualize the conversation um, for the rest of this talk. Starting with usefulness. So what is usefulness? It's a product's clarity of its own content and purpose. The goodness of a product, uh, or the usefulness of a product, uh, is evaluated by finding answers to four questions. Uh, who is going to use the system? Why are they going to use the system? When and where are they going to use the system? And how are they going to get there? And these questions have been increasingly brought about in the conversation for uh, visualizations to kind of understand the context of the application. But why is this important? Well, once you know who the answers to these four questions, you can answer the bigger question, that is, what purpose does the application serve for the user? Because once the purpose is identified, then we can look at the different tasks or operations that that application needs to support. For instance, when we were building bar charts, sorry, scatter plots, we looked at all the different visualization systems that provided interactive scatter plots. And these are different features that all of them had. This is a group list of about 35 different features. But then when we went back to thinking about who the user is and why might they be using a scatter plot system on a tablet, we pruned this down to about 13 different operations that were central to our work that we wanted to support in our system. So the next step is the usability, where it's the ease of use or how you're designing the ease of use. And once we identify appropriate interactions from the previous step, the question is how do you support, sorry, appropriate operations from the previous step, how do we support them with the different interactions? Often we use interaction design principles to impart usability to a tool. Uh, but the domain of information visualization in our experience was different in that a lot of these principles, some of them actually got amplified over the others, which was different. And I'm going to actually sh talk to you about, about some of those, uh, which were guessability, learnability, affordances, ergonomics, and exceptions. Well, given how complex they sound, you would almost wish that there was some sort of an abbreviation to it. Uh, there is uh, for people who are Scrubs fans. Uh, but uh, let's now actually try and discuss this individually. So guessability. So what is guessability? Well, it's exactly what you would guess. Uh, it's uh, the idea that if you're building interactions, you should start from the ones that are familiar to the users. And what better way to find these options than to actually go to the users directly? So some of the early work in the guessability studies uh, started where the users would be presented with the starting position of an operation and an ending position, for instance, sorting or selection, uh, where you would see a, all the data points and only one of them would be selected. And the questions the user would be asked is, how would you perform this operation? Uh, doing it over multiple users actually generated results such as these. So this is results from the user responses for a study, from a study on tabletops in particular. The results actually here show that the most common gestures for cutting an object on a large table uh, is to actually slash on it directly. Uh, and to paste uh, an object is to actually bring it from outside. The problem with using these uh, responses is that people tend to only bring out the options that they've previously seen or used. So we rarely see novel approaches to an interaction or an operation. So for instance, in the recent few years, we've seen different gestures such as pull to refresh or sliding panel layers or swipe to reveal being very popular. Almost every new app's kind of using it now. But it's also fair to assume that before these gestures were commonplace, a guessability study by going to the users would actually bring these out as options. Another issue here is that users are very inconsistent about their responses. So if you, they would use the same gesture for different things across uh, along the, on the same single study. 
So if, if, if this doesn't re result in rich enough responses, then the other options, we actually go back to existing systems and UI guidelines and see if those can help us. For instance, for our work, two systems were very relevant. Uh, one of them is TouchWave, which was uh, Dominicus Barr and, and colleagues, uh, which uses uh, multi-touch interactions for manipulating stack graphs. Uh, Dominicus actually talked about a similar topic two years ago, and he's gonna talk about a different topic tomorrow. Uh, Another system that was relevant uh, was uh, Kinetica, which is uh, an, a system that uses physics-based interactions with objects, where data points are actually represented as particles that attract and repel each other based on certain properties. Uh, these two systems were very relevant. Uh, but the problem was that they either used a technique, which was not what we were addressing, like in the first case, or they had an entirely different purpose, or the, the way they defined their purpose was entirely different than the way we defined our purpose. Uh, so coming back, we then realized that we need to do an internal guessability approach. We need to guess our own interactions. So for instance, uh, for different, different types of operations that we supported, one of which was Zoom, we just created a list of different gestures that we think were appropriate for this operation. We went ahead and then we implemented all of these different gestures and then we just chose the one that seemed to work best. Uh, I think at the end of the day, you can build off of principles, but you're your best user um, in some sense. So uh, a different part to the same conversation is about learnability of gestures. And uh, that's kind of easier to talk about in three parts, uh, complexity, discoverability, and the expected action. So complexity of a gesture that you might use in the system depends on four things. It's the duration, how long it takes a user to perform an action, the distance the user needs to travel to perform an action, the number of fingers that they're using for that action, and the number of taps required. I mean, in no order, the, the more these values increase, the more complex the gesture gets for the user to perform. And an example I'll give you that we did use in our system was that of tap and pan. Uh, this is the gesture that's kind of commonplace, at least in the Android, Android OS. Here's somebody using this gesture to zoom in in Google Maps using just one finger. You tap once, and then you tap again, but without lifting your finger, you just drag it around. We actually use the same gesture in our uh, system to select a range of values on the x-axis. The user taps once, and without lifting the second time, drags it around. The response that we got was from people was bad. People just completely <laughs> hated this gesture. Uh, they had a very difficult time performing the gesture right out of the bat. I mean, we were giving them enough options to try it. They weren't familiar with it, so they weren't using it. Once they did get around to learning it, every next time they would themselves try and perform it, they would simply go back to the basic pan gesture instead of like tapping and then panning. Uh, so that was a good thing to learn. In the subsequent version, we actually did not use this gesture. We just went back to basic panning gesture. Uh, another common conversation people tend to have is discoverability. Like the gestures or the different interactions that you use in your system should be discoverable. Uh, well, within the context of information visualization, we've realized that this is not paramount. And it's actually kind of going away from the guidelines and that's usually proposed. Two reasons for this. Uh, the first is that tools that you use for visualization on desktop, such as Tableau and Spotfire, cannot really be called as walk-up and use systems. I mean, you can't expect a user to just not know how to use them, go on them, and be able to perform all the sets of tasks and operations. This is not really to do with the usability of the underlying tool. It's more something to do with the domain of information visualization, which is feature-rich and very complex. Uh, so we believe that when we're building a tool for tablets, it kind of faces similar kind of conversation pieces where there's enough and more features in that tablet system that you don't expect the user to find out the interactions for all, these, all those features themselves. And another reason on the same point is that even consumer applications, for instance, here Mailbox, which uses gestures, even they have to spend time onboarding the users on mobile interfaces. And we believe we have to do the same even in our system. So, uh, overall, when we, were, when we were designing sort of the guidelines of our system, we thought discoverability was not key. It was not key to design for discoverability in mind. A third and the final step in learnability is the expect, expected action. Uh, 
there's some gestures that are aligned with users' expectation. And in those cases, the learning curve is minimal. Um, some of the examples of these gestures are tapping, double tapping, panning, and pinching. Users are familiar with these gestures from having used it on other applications. But what it does for your system is that the user expects these gestures to do something. Uh, so the rule that we always follow is that have some sort of a response in the system, even if it doesn't change the state of the system, make sure the user realizes that the system has understood or accepted that gesture. For instance, in our system, we, we use double tap gesture extensively. All the double tap gesture is used forever to just zoom out of the view, uh, irrespective of the type of chart that we might be um, building. Another gesture that we saw people increasingly try was using the menu reveal on swipes. So uh, on the edges of the menu, they expected to swipe in and some sort of, uh, OK. Let's try it again. To have some sort of a menu pop in. In this case, we had a filters menu coming in from the right. Uh, the third piece I'm quickly going to cover is affordance, uh, which are the cues for guiding interaction. Very well established concept in HCI. Uh, how we use this in our system. So I was showing you a feature where the user could pan on the small rectangle on the right to preview the different attributes in the, in, the, in the data. So how does the user know how to pan in that area? So the solution we used was we added a texture on that particular region, which made it feel like it was draggable. We expected that the user could see the distinct color and in some sense make a connection that this gesture, this, up, this area does something different. And every time they would open the panel, the color and the texture would stand out uh, as both a reminder and a prompt to the user. Another example in similar lines is the same uh, drop-down menu, but on the y-axis at the top left, we placed the preview region on the left-hand side instead of the right-hand side. Uh, this was naturally affording the user to use their left hand instead of their right hand. So if they use the right hand, they would likely occlude the view way more than they would uh, by using their left hand. Ergonomics also plays some important concerns um, in the way you go about designing this, these systems. Uh, and ergonomics essentially can be designed as the efficiency in interacting with the system. So this is how we expected this user to use the system. They have a left hand that's holding the tablet. They have a right hand that's interacting with the system. So at no point do they have both the hands available to use. I mean, it's a constraint that we put on ourselves, which effectively decided that we don't support multi-hand gestures uh, on the tablet. And deciding between using one hand and two hands versus one finger or two finger gestures actually has a direct effect on how much the view is occluded or the interactions uh, the user performing occludes the underlying visualization. For instance, here's how Apple describes the pinch to zoom interaction. The location is not important as long as the location is on the view of the video or the image, the view zooms in. Here's how we're supporting pinched operation in one way, which is on the axis. The, the user to scale the axis, user has to pinch directly on the axis. Similarly, to user to select a range on the axis, user has to drag directly on the axis. So what it does here is that in both these situations, you see that while the user is pinching or dragging, they're actually occluding the value that they're looking at. Uh, for instance, on the right image, I don't know if you can see it clearly, user wants to select the value of 160, but the number 160 is right below his finger, so he can't even see the value 160. So occlusion, like this kind of occlusion aspects of what we found very particular, very specific to uh, data visualization systems. Uh, for instance, in this case, we solve for this by providing those two numbers at the top so that while the user is actually performing panning, they see the live feedback of what data values are being selected. Uh, finally, exceptions. So there's the concept of conflicts versus consistency. As you uh, support multiple types of charts, consistency across those charts in terms of what operations, what gestures are used for what operations becomes very important. It's very important for familiarity. It's very important for ease of learning. However, maintaining this consistency often leads to a lot of design conflicts. And I'm going to bring one example out uh, of bar charts. 
Uh, so this is, again, one of the systems I built with Danielle about a couple of, two, three years ago now. Uh, here, this is an operation that does panning to sort the values. So you just pan on the axis vertically, and it sorts uh, the value, um, the bars based on a particular value other than the x or the y axis. In the system that I showed you previously, we're using this gesture for something else. We're using this gesture to actually select a range of values on the x axis. So this is Scatterplot. It uses padding to select a range of values on the x axis or the y axis. So if now the, if we brought in a bar chart into the same mix, same tool, what do we expect the, the system to do if the user pans on the y axis? Well, to maintain consistency, it should now not sort. It should actually select the bars, and that's what it does. But then the problem that we have here is that sorting would require some other gesture. Sorting was optimal by just panning on the y-axis because it, it decided which axis to sort on, and it told us which direction to sort on. So it was very useful in that sense. But now it needs another gesture that is suboptimal, just because this one gesture has been used in a different context uh, across the whole application. So these kind of issues keep coming up when you're expanding your system. And then in many cases, you actually have to go back and change them some of the designs that you previously uh, um, chosen, um, some design choices you previously made. In this case, we actually changed the gesture to hold plus pan. So user first holds on the axis, which activates the sorting state, and then pans to sort in one or the other uh, direction. So this might look like a lot to process, understandably. Uh, I'd like to give you a few examples of how these uh, fed back into the design decisions that we took. So these were the list of different options I showed you for the zooming interaction. Uh, so how do, they, how do they work? So the fixed aspect ratio zoom is as user expects. As a user pinches on the view, the whole view zooms out, maintaining the um, scales of both axes consistently. Uh, in the same term, a flexible axis zoom would zoom the view based on the actual motion of the user, the distance between the user's fingers in X and the Y axis separately. So they're basically independent on the two axes. But the, but the, uh, uh, the motion is simultaneous. The zooming is simultaneous on both axes. When we built this gesture, it was too complex for users to try. They would, never, they would pinch on the view, and they would just not be able to get the kind of configuration they would need it. Because if we're pinching on images or videos, we're not used to pinching in a specific direction. We just pinch. Uh, we expect because the scaling happens on the both axes simultaneously. So then we went back to the third option, which was an axis-based zoom, where if the user wants to pinch and zoom on the x-axis, they pinch on the x-axis. If they want to zoom on the y-axis, they pinch on the y-axis. So you're basically separating the interactions for each axis. But now the problem was that the interactions weren't happening simultaneously for the two axes. Another option was select plus zoom, where different to the pinch gesture, the user first selects the region that they're interested in. And then they just simply double tap on the region, and then it pinches and zooms into that particular view. Another common operation is automatic zoom, is what we call automatic zoom. You just basically double tap on the view, and it automatically finds out the best zoom state, so that uh, it's minimizing the occlusion, basically. And finally, zoom lens, where, which is, again, one of the features I showed you. Uh, you pinch on the view. It shows up a lens. Uh, it's fun. It's interactive. Uh, people don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> finally, desirability. Um, so if you've done with uh, utility, the usefulness, the usability, it sort of comes back to the desirability, the last element of adding grace and elegance to your system. And making, and making some interactions fun, interesting, and even quirky actually piques users' interests. Uh, users' interests can be tickled in that sense. Uh, this has a direct fact, effect on the engagement of the user. And there's no real formula to achieving it. You have both the visual uh, side to play with as well as the interactive side to play with. Uh, but some of my favorite applications actually showcase this behavior. Uh, one of those examples is Paper uh, by 53. Uh, this provides an array of highly engaging interactions uh, while successfully keeping the complexity of those interactions hidden. Uh, another example is an app that actually, uh, the company that no longer exists, it's called Planetary. Uh, 
Again, highly appealing visuals. Uh, there are responses, responsive to user uh, actions in real time. And I was thinking that adding such a piece would, would not be difficult. Uh, here's actually Ro uh, Robert Hodgin, who's the guy who built, um, or helped build Planetary, talking about how simple it is. So this particular particle emitter will be, um, will use a graphic that is hard to see. It's like a, a crescent glow. The other particle emitter will use something more like a, a, a smoke sprite. So you combine the glow and the smoke and the sphere and the coronal ring and the texture and you've got a fairly nice looking star form. You've got a fairly nice looking star form. It's just that simple. I wish we could, you could use this in a scatterplot application, to be honest, but it's not that simple. Uh, coming back to Earth, uh, we, in some of the visualization applications, uh, the one that we, we've seen is TouchWave, equally engaging, and not least because the author is actually sitting in the audience. It's actually engaging. Uh, the, some of the, some of the features that we saw, uh, we actually tried to incorporate in our own system. Uh, one of them was zoom lens. Obviously, I gave you an example. Uh, people found it to be very interactive, a lot of fun, but as soon as you put them in the context of a task, they were just not using it, like I said. Uh, another example there is uh, Lasso. Uh, Lasso was very supportive of sort of drawing interesting, funny, different kinds of um, operations. This is actually my girlfriend using it. I spend months building the tool, and I go to her, and all she does is draw fancy <laughs> artwork. So uh, that helps uh, still. Uh, finally, trying to wrap up, uh, I'd like to give you just two uh, basic takeaways. Uh, so I gave, attempted to give you a broad overview of the touch plus visualization space uh, with a set of criteria for designing this space. Uh, I also tried uh, to discuss this within the framework of usefulness, usability, and desirability. Uh, which, if followed in order, actually really help. I mean, if you tackle what's useful for, what, how the system is useful first, then tackle the usability, and then finally the desirability really helps your work. Uh, hope you liked it. Thank you.